People have a, a, a difficulty believing that God is hearing their prayer. And number two, they're even praying in such a way that God does hear their prayer. So James Merritt joins me today and is the author of The God Who Hears and says, when you pray, you have his full attention and he doesn't put you on hold. A lot of people, as you know, have very much difficulty in praying, even Christians who are veteran, I would say. Nobody ever gets to the graduate school of prayer, hardly in my opinion. And I think one of the reasons why is, number one, we've got so much going on in our lives, we get too busy. And, and I, I, one of my favorite statements about prayer is if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. Uh, but I, I think the key is recognizing that the moment you hit the prayer button, it's as if the creator of the universe drops everything he's doing. He puts everything aside. He focuses in on you like a laser and he is, you have his full attention. That's, that's exactly what we want to hear. We want to know that God is listening to the prayers, but you know, why should people not give up on prayer? That the best way to pray, in my opinion, and it's changed my prayer life, is to pray God's words back to him. And even more specifically, God's prayers back to him. My mentor was a great preacher named Adrian Rogers. And uh, Dr. Rogers, I have a, a little thing we give out at our church, a little prayer bookmark. And here's what Dr. Rogers said. He said, the prayer that gets to heaven starts in heaven. And I believe that with all of my heart. And so this book is based on Paul's prison prayers. And so when you pray these prayers, you don't have to wonder, is God hearing this prayer? Or is God paying attention to this prayer? Or is this prayer making it? Because you're praying God's own word back to him. And so it's one of the most powerful ways I know to pray. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes, you know, we think, okay, how do we pray? Do we, do we pray in, in, in our own flesh? Do we play, pray in God's will? How do you know what's the flesh? What's God's will? Yeah. I think the best way again is, is you always try to, and that's just your prayer life. It's all every part of your life. You always align your prayer life with the word of God always. And so for example, um, you know, the, the Bible says two things. Number one, you have not because you don't ask. So the, you know, I tell people all the time, I guarantee you there's a prayer God doesn't answer. And that's the prayer you don't pray. But number two, the Bible says you have not because you ask amiss. You, you ask either for the wrong thing or ask for it at the wrong time or with the wrong motive. And so I, I think that when, again, when you go back and you begin to really center your prayer and you make your prayer based on the word of God, then you know when, when your prayers line up with the word of God, you know they line up with the will of God. So let me give you an example. We were talking about reaching people for Christ just before we started this podcast. Well, I know the word of God says God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God himself said. So when I'm praying, and I, every Tuesday I pray for lost people. And so when I'm praying for a specific lost person, I will say, Lord, I know because you told me it is not your will that that person should perish. You want that person to come to the truth. So that's my prayer today, that this person would come to the truth. And Lord, I also know that it is the job of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So Holy Spirit of God, would you please right now convict that person of sin and righteousness and judgment? So when I pray the word of God or according to the word of God, I know I'm praying in the will of God. Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, I just want to kind of touch base. You said you went through a situation that you thought you couldn't fix on your own. What did you realize? Well, the first thing I realized is just what you just said. I'm a fixer by nature. Most pastors are. Uh, a lot of people are. And um, I had done everything on my own that I knew to do to fix the problem. And it wasn't that I was making it worse, but it was getting worse. And I finally had to realize that all I could do was two things. Number one, pray for the situation and the people involved in the situation. And number two, unconditionally love the people involved in the situation mm -hmm. and leave the results to God. Now, I will frankly tell your listeners, I got discouraged because this was a two-year process mm -hmm. of praying every single day. It prayed on my mind. It played on my mind. It was with me. It was like a 
cloud that went with me Nancy, everywhere you everywhere I went, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it taught me perseverance in prayer. Mm -hmm. One of the problems people have with prayer is this, they give up too easily. Yes. And as I say in the book, prayer is rarely a one and done deal. Mm -hmm. When Jesus said, ask and seek and knock, those verbs in the Greek language are in the, are in the present tense, which denotes continuous action. What Jesus literally said was this, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. And I believe too often we give up on prayer. And the problem with giving up on prayer, when you give up on prayer, you give up on God. And you should never give up on God. And that's one of the things that I learned. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's so it's so difficult, though, you know, as you're going through things to keep depending on God to to see you through. But literally, we don't realize that he grows you and matures you in prayer. So how do we do go from, say, like a, a maybe I hate to say, it, but like a shallow prayer life, you know, it's all about me and what I want to a God, it's your will and I will give up whatever I want what you want well as i point out in the book it's interesting that you know these are paul's prison prayers he wrote these from prison and one of the things i point out it's one of the most amazing things about these prayers you know if you and i if we were just being honest if you and i were in prison particularly for something we didn't do and we did not even know but what the next day we we're going to die for something we didn't do or for, for, for a crime we didn't commit or whatever we would be praying one simple prayer. I know I would be. Get me out of here. That's what I'd be praying. Yeah. But when you read these prayers, what's amazing is here's Paul in prison, not knowing but what these words he's writing would be the last words he'd ever write. Not knowing but what the day that he's writing these words will be the last day he will ever live. He's not praying for himself. Mm -hmm. He's praying for others. And I think one of the reasons why Jesus said in, 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 to, to, in the Sermon on the Mount, don't pray like the pagans do. God already knows what you need before you ask, which raises the question, okay, wait a minute. If God already knows what I need, why bother to pray? Well, number one, we pray because we're commanded to pray. So you, that, that takes care of that issue. But number two, when you already know that God knows what you need, it frees you to pray for the needs of others. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I want to say before before I forget it, if 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 I could if I could get people to understand one lesson in this book, it would be this lesson. The primary purpose of prayer is not to get God to do something for you. It is to get God and allow God to do something in you. We want prayer to change things and prayer does change things. And we want prayer to change people and it does change people. But the primary change that God wants to affect in prayer is in us. And when you realize that, and when you realize that there's not a greater thing you can do for your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, your loved ones, your enemies, there's not a greater thing you can do than to intercede for them and pray for them and stand in the gap. It just frees up your anxieties about, well, what about me? What about what I want? And it's almost as if God is saying, I tell you what, you take care of my business and I'll take care of yours. I, you know, let me tell you, I tell, talk about this all the time when um, I was having, you know, my husband and I were kind of like on that rocky road and I would, I would have to say, you know, for years, Lord, you know, you know, change him. But it, it wasn't about that. I had to say, change my stony heart. Cause I, you know, the, the Ezekiel prayer, make it a heart of flesh because that's the only way it was going to change. And I, I see a lot of people thinking like, oh, I, if I pray that they will stop this, you know, and stop being this way, maybe it's something that we're, our approach is, and we need God to change us. So in that being said, um, why is it so important to know who you are in Christ when you pray? Well, because one of the men, one of the, thoughts you've got to get in your mind and we say it in the Lord's prayer, but we don't think about it. When you are praying, you're not a subject going in to see a king. You're not a client going in to see 
someone you've employed. You're not an employee going to see a boss. You're a child going to see a, a father who welcomes you, who wants to spend time with you, who wants to hear from you, and who, by the way, wants to talk with you. Prayer should be a dialogue, not a monologue. Who wants to talk with you, who wants to love you and wants you to love him. And when you get that metaphor in your mind, it, it has a way of, number one, calming your spirit. Number two, it motivates you to want to put the computer aside and the iPhone aside and everything else you got going on and just focus on your heavenly father and love. Because let me tell you what prayer is. Prayer is a dress rehearsal for eternity. That's what we're going to be doing in eternity. Loving God, blessing God, praising God, conversing from God, hearing from God, worshiping God. That's what prayer is. And when you finally realize that the most powerful thing you will do every day of your life is to pray. You and I won't do anything more important. This podcast, me working on a sermon, whatever it may be. We won't do anything more important today than just continuously being a spirit of prayer, communing with our Heavenly Father, our ears always open to hear from him. Our eyes always open to see him. Our hearts always open to obey him. Nothing you'll do today will have more impact on others and more of an influence on you than prayer. Mm -hmm. So many prayer questions that I that have come into my mind. But, you know, can you give somebody a tool to um, maybe use to hearing from God? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what I would call it a tool. What I would call it is time. And I think there are two ways you hear from God. Number one is in God's word. I read my Bible every day. That, that, that's one thing my mom and dad, my mom especially instilled in me when I got saved as a nine-year-old boy. And it's, it's to read the Bible because that is the primary way we hear from God. It is. It's not feelings. It's not emotions. It's not even counsel of other people. The primary way you hear from God is the word of God. But the second thing I say is, and I say this, I think, in the book, I think there are times that we're so busy talking to God and trying to get out everything we want and what our requests are, what our desires are. I think sometimes that God is up there and he just wants to say, will you just be quiet for just a moment and let me get a word in edgewise? You know, what does the word of God do? say? Be still and know that I am God. How does God speak to us in that still, small voice? Remember that. There would be a still, small voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Well, when there's a still, small voice, the only way you're going to hear that voice is to be quiet mm -hmm. and to listen. And so I think that one of the things I would say to, to answer to your question is to remember that prayer should always be a monologue, not a dialogue. There's a prayer that, that God gave me about four years ago in my quiet time. And I, I shared it with our church. And it's one of the things that really revolutionized my prayer life. I prayed every day. But I'll just say it very quickly. I'll say, Lord, I love you supremely. I worship you exclusively. I want to serve you gladly. I want to glorify you continuously. I want to praise you joyfully. I want to thank you constantly. And then here's how I finish my prayer. Fill me with your power and thrill me with your presence maximize my desire for you, minimize my desire for anything else. And then this is the key part. This is the last thing I pray. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my faults. As if there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. And then I just get quiet. And you know, it's amazing how God will remind you of things you need to confess. It were, it's amazing how God will remind you you're not as good as you thought you were yesterday. There are things you should have done you didn't do or things you did you shouldn't have done. And so it's during that time when you're just quiet that God will speak to your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes me think while you're talking about it, like how how you're how you get cleaned out, right? How you get just getting cleaned out of all the things that you need to let go of, and and that allows God to enter. Almost like I was reading this morning about the de you know in in Matthew about the demons, you know that that in came in and then when they were gone it couldn't come back in because the house was clean. So you're cleaning, you are on a constant clean out um, it, through prayer and, um, and your connection to Jesus. So if you're, you're stuck and you don't know what to do, how should we pray? Yeah. I have a message I preach called what to do 
when you don't know what to do. And it's very easy. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do what you know to do. So you know to pray. Whether you pray or not, you know you should pray. So it's not real, comp this is not comp it's not brain, it's not, you know, rocket science here. You don't have to be an Einstein. When you're stuck, keep praying. When you're stuck, keep reading God's word. When you're stuck, keep talking to the Lord. When you're stuck, keep listening to the Lord. Do what you know to do, knowing, and, and this is so important. When we start, if, if you, it's like a train. If you put your feelings at the front of the train instead of in the caboose where it belongs, your train's going to get off track every time. Mm -hmm. If you only pray when you feel like praying, you won't pray a lot. If you only read your Bible when you feel like reading your Bible, you won't read your Bible very much. It actually comes out, you know, I tell people this all the time. I know what you're going to do today at the end of the day. And you, I'm telling you, what, you, and you really know what I'm going to do. You say, no, you, no, I don't, James. Yeah, you do. We do what we want to do. At the end of the day, you look back and say, well, I didn't have time. No, no, no. You did what you wanted to do. I didn't have time to read my Bible. No, that's not why you didn't read your Bible. You didn't, you didn't, because that's really not what you wanted to do. We do what we want to do. So when you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. And we know what we should do. Read the, get into God's word. Put that phone down, shut the computer off, spend your time talking to God. And it doesn't matter whether you feel like he's hearing you or not is irrelevant. Well, you know, if you feel like right now, he's, James is not listening to me, but the fact is I am. Well, I feel like you're not talking to me. Well, the fact is you are. So you don't rely on your feelings. You rely on facts. And the fact of prayer is that God always hears. And by the way, God always answers prayer. Let me just say this for you. I know we're coming to our end pretty quick. People say, well, you know, God didn't answer my prayer. And here's this. this people don't like to hear this. No is an answer. No is an answer. Some of the greatest prayers I've ever prayed, believe it or not, and the ones I'm most thankful for are the ones God didn't answer. If God had given me everything I prayed for and everything I wanted, I'd probably been a hot mess right now. So thank God, not just for the yeses, thank God for the noes. I totally agree with you. I totally agree. A lot of no prayers. Thank God he didn't answer, you know, because you could have been in quicksand. You could have been in the quicksand. Uh, and, um, you know, that's the thing, too, is that I'm thinking to myself, like a lot of people say, like, you know, I, I'm I'm not worthy of of pray of God. I'm not worthy of God. And, and and I my prayers, you know, I'm afraid to ask for this. I'm afraid to ask for that. In storms and trials, how should we pray? Yeah. Well, let me give a very simple answer to that. Uh, on the one hand, without Jesus, we're not worthy. With Jesus, we are worthy. So frankly, when a believer who knows the Lord says, I'm not worthy, I say this with all respect, that's false humility. In matter of fact, it's an insult to Jesus. Because his death and his burial and resurrection, his resurrection made us worthy. I don't walk into God's throne room strutting like I'm somebody. I go in knowing that I'm there for one simple reason, by the grace of God and my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives me access. He's the one who makes the appointment. He's the one who opens the door. He's the one that pulls the chair out and says, have a seat. So I don't go in because I'm worthy. I go in because he is worthy and he has made me worthy. And in humbleness, I can tell just by what, how you're talking, when we go to the throne with our requests, we go in humbleness because, you know, sometimes, yeah, I mean, I've, I've yelled at God. I, you know, like I didn't understand what he was doing. I, I'm yelling at him and, and it was like, oh, you yell at God. Well, yeah, because, you know, he's my, my creator and I have to ask him, why are you making me walk through this? Why am I doing this? I don't understand. But, you know, th this is something that he understands because he created us. So we can ask him in that way. But when we are really at the lowest point of our lives and we're walking through such a big storm, we need to walk in humbleness because he's refreshing, renewing and giving us a, a you know, a better mind, right. in, in Christ. And so, um, so what advice would you have for someone struggling to find the words to pray? That would be my last question to you. Yeah. It's my go-to again. Um, 
if, if you're starting with the words you ought to pray, then go to the words you know you can pray. Go to his word. Go to, the, go, to, go to the Paul's prison prayers. Go to the Lord's prayer. Go to all the prayers all the saints prayed in the word of God. But I want to go back to, to this last point you just said, because I want every, every here to hear this that's listening today. My favorite saying that I love to say about myself is this. The only thing good about me is that Jesus lives in me. And that's true of you. The only thing good about you is Jesus lives in you. Because the scripture, there's none that does good. No, not one. That's true. But when Jesus comes in you, all the goodness of God lives in you. So I, I would just say, again, it's all because of Jesus. It's always going to all be because of Jesus. All because of Jesus and who he is and who I am in him is why I know we can always be on praying ground and we can go to God with anything we have. He wants to hear from us, knowing that he won't give, always give us what we want, but he'll always give us what is best. You can get James's book, The God Who Hears, on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. And you can find out more about James and watch his program, Touching Lives with James Merritt, on touchinglives.org. And James, what would you like to leave my audience with today? Three words. God hears prayer. It is the greatest thought about God in a way you know you could think. It, it, think about what I just said. The creator of this universe hears prayer. You don't have to be, the, it doesn't matter whether you're the president of the United States or you're a custodian in a public school. God hears prayer. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts on our conversation by putting your comments below and visit the call with nancycebedo.com to learn more about me and what we do here on the ministry. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Your support means so much to us. Well,